My name is Kelly Lytle Hernandez, and I'm a professor of history and African American studies here at UCLA. I'm also the director of the Ralph Bunch Center for African American Studies. I have written two books. The first book is called Migra, A History of the U.S. Border Patrol. And the second book is City of Inmates, Conquest, Rebellion, and the Rise of Human Caging in Los Angeles. The, the writing and the research for these two books makes me an expert in a variety of fields. One of them is the history of Mexican immigration to the United States. And some of the other fields that um, I have some strong depth in is policing and incarceration, um, especially in the U.S.-Mexico border region. The important historical context for Mexican repatriation during the 1930s, really you have to go back into at least the 1920s to understand what happens during the 1930s. And during the 1920s, there was this rising anti-immigrant sentiment across the United States. Um, it goes from New York City to Los Angeles to El Paso, all over. And this anti-immigrant sentiment resulted in the passage of one very, very important law that really dictates who's allowed to enter the country between 1924 and 1965. That law is called the 1924 Immigration Act, or the Quota Act, or the National Origins Act. It can be called any one of those three things. What that law does is it limits the number of immigrants who are allowed to enter the United States every year by defining a set of quotas that will be given out per country. 96% of all the quota slots are reserved for European immigrants in particular. So you can see that in the mathematics of that law, what the legislators were doing, what Congress was really doing, was creating a whites-only immigration law. Now there's an exception that's written into the 1924 Act, and that exception allows unrestricted immigration from the Western Hemisphere. How do we get this exemption? This exception is written into the law because the agribusiness people, the railroad owners, and other major industries in the American West were saying, look, we can't survive without Mexican workers. That these industries were first built on the backs of Native American workers. Well, we launched the Indian Wars, and we launched campaigns of genocide against California Indians in particular. That labor source is no longer available to us in the numbers that we needed. We restricted Chinese immigrants in 1882 and continue to do th so through the 1920s. We don't have access to Chinese workers. We don't have access to Japanese workers. And we don't want black workers. So Mexican workers are the only ones that remain. And so they went to Congress and they said, if you lock out Mexican workers, you're going to destroy our industries here on the West Coast. So it's in response to those employers in the American West that you get the exception that's written into the 1924 law. The issue is that there are still many people across the United States who want to see a comprehensive whites-only immigration law. So throughout the 1920s, these eugenicists, these sort of racial, cultural nationalists continue to go to Congress and get Mexicans written into the quote law. In 1926, 1927, 1928, 1929, they go back and they go back and they go back. So there's still this very strong anti-Mexican sentiment in particular that is raging across the United States, even though we have unrestricted Mexican immigration. When the Great Depression hits in 1929, this becomes the opportunity for that anti-Mexican sentiment to really spill over and to become policy. So after the Great Depression begins in 1929, there's this new opportunity for anti-Mexican sentiment to become policy and practice of pushing out all of the Mexican immigrants who had entered the United States during the 1920s, although we had this national quota law. By 1929, this is really important, 10% of the population of Mexico lived in the United States. It's a massive population. In Los Angeles, the community of Mexican immigrants is so large that there's no other population, Mexican population, in the world outside of Mexico City that's as large as the Mexican population of Los Angeles. So there are very significant colonias, or Mexican communities, across the United States namely in the southwestern United States, anchored in places like Los Angeles, San Antonio, El Paso, and so on. In, or in response to these very large Mexican communities that were growing 
amid a moment of very strong anti-immigrant sentiment, you have local authorities, namely in Chicago and Los Angeles and some other places, that begin to organize to encourage Mexican workers, to push Mexican workers to return back to Mexico. There never is a national repatriation program. This is largely something that happens at the local level, and it largely happens through pressure, removing Mexican families from social services, um, food support, housing support, um, by creating a context in which it's very difficult for people to feel comfortable or safe living in the United States. I would say it's certainly very resonant with a moment that we're living in right now for many immigrants, Mexicans and Central Americans in particular. It's amid this political and cultural context that the Mexican government introduces a program um, called repatriation. And the Mexican government reaches out to all the Mexican immigrants in the United States and says, come back to Mexico. We want to tap into everything you've learned in modern American agriculture and modern American business. We don't want to bring you back to Mexico. We want to see you build irrigation. We want to see you build roads. We want to see you build modern farms. So if you come back, we'll give you land, we'll give you seed, we'll give you implements so you can modernize the Mexican economy. So it's between the pressure that's pushing Mexican immigrants out of the United States and like buying them railroad tickets to go down to the border and the invitation that's coming from the Mexican government that you get this program, this moment called repatriation, in which about 400,000 Mexicans leave the United States during the 1930s. One more thing I want to say about repatriation, this is very important, is that it's often cast in the popular discourse as a moment of mass deportation when one to four million Mexicans were kicked out of the United States um, forcibly. That's not accurate. The numbers that we have is closer to 400,000 people who participate in the repatriation program. More important than that is we have to understand that there was a very strong politics of removing Mexicans from the United States throughout the 1920s. If it was just the fact that Mexicans were being told to go home, that was the trigger for the repatriations of the 1930s, they would have left a lot earlier, right? They had withstood all that pressure for at least a decade prior to the repatriation program. So what's really important to understand here is that during this moment, these are Mexican immigrants who are making calculated decisions about their well-being and where their best opportunities lay. These are not historical actors with no agency, no power, no thought, no intellect. They are seeing the world change very rapidly around them. They are seeing new opportunities emerge and they're taking advantage of them. I think that's really important for people to see. I think it's also important that we not inflate the numbers of repatriation and deportation. Why? When we inflate the numbers and we say it's somewhere between 1 million and 4 million, it makes it very difficult for us to see um, really the crisis in which we're living today. That if it doesn't compare to these mass deportations, this mass terror that we've made up in our minds about the 1930s, then it's not as bad as it was. I would actually argue that the moment we're living in right now is just as bad as the 1930s. And if we really accurately understand what happened then, it was about this um, media campaign, this politics of pressure, this hope that Mexicans would self-deport. In fact, we are very much living in the same moment. It's important for us to ask and answer the question of if so many Mexicans went back during the 1930s uh, because of these offers of land and it looked as though the opportunity was better in Mexico, why did they start coming back toward the ends of, end of the 1930s and certainly in very large numbers Mexican immigrants crossing the border in the 1940s and the 1950s in particular. Well, the promises uh, that the Mexican government made were not fulfilled. The land that they were given was often rocky and was not good for agriculture. And so when they went back to Mexico and tried to make a go of it, in many, many cases they were isolated and the promises that they had been given were not fulfilled. So when the conditions changed in the United States and the economy started to improve, in particular around the buildup and mobilization for World War II, Mexican immigrants returned to be vital members of the U.S. economy during that time period. 
Historiography is the debate about the stories we tell about the past. We all have different perspectives on what happened last week in our family. We all have different perspectives on um, how a certain event went down in high school. You all get back together, you talk about it, and person A disagrees with person B about the facts of the situation and their own perspective on it. That's all that historiography is. It's a bunch of historians getting together who have done different kinds of research, who bring different perspectives to the work that they do, and then we have debates about what happened in the past. The historiography on repatriation is getting deeper by the year. Some of the first books on the repatriation movement of the 1930s came out in the 1970s, and um, Abraham Hoffman in particular wrote about this moment of mass removal and the politics, the anti-Mexican politics of the time period. Many people have written since then, Francisco Baldrama um, is one of the most notable historians who have written on um, repatriation. I think that I differ from a lot of the standard perspectives on repatriation in one important way, that repatriation was a, a vicious, moment of anti-Mexican politics. There is no doubt about that. But the fact that 400,000 people roughly participated in the program at a moment when there were 1.5 million Mexicans in the United States, that the vast majority of Mexicans were not removed from the country, it actually speaks something a little bit different to me. And when I get into the archive and I read people's oral histories, what I see is a people who were under enormous pressure, and many people decided to stay in the United States, and some decided to go. I don't see a total U.S. power and authority of mass deportation only crisis. I see a community that is dancing with struggle, as everybody is during the Great Depression, and making a set of different decisions about, um, about their own futures. And that, to me, feels like a more human history, that Mexicans are not just historical actors who are pushed around by the past, some of the forces of the past, but in fact, can stay on their ground, can make decisions, can um, evade deportation, that deportation is not the massive and successful tool of the state. It never has been and it never will be. And for me, repatriation helps us see that story. It's really important that students in Los Angeles know this history of repatriation because it is true that during this period about one-third of the Mexican population of Los Angeles returned to Mexico. This is really important because as we move into the 1940s, we really have the formation of the first Mexican-American generation. Um, children who were born here during the 1930s, um, there's not so much migration that's happening into the United States during the 1930s. And they grow up as the first Mexican-American community and generations. These are the people who would go on in the 40s, I mean in the 50s and the 60s to be the activists of the time period it's because they feel so grounded to the principles of the United States and that they are entitled to the United States Constitution and to a living wage um, and to respect in the workplace, that they go on to fight for the rights here in the United States rather than um, return home to Mexico. Understanding repatriation as a moment when Mexican immigrants um, looked at the world around them and made decisions about what their best options were is really, really important. Why? We're often told that border fences and border walls and immigration police and deportation can control immigration. That is not true. During the 1930s, we saw a moment when a large number of Mexican immigrants went home. It's not because of immigration policing, and it's not because of deportation, it's not because of the U.S. Border Patrol. It's because people made decisions about the options that lay ahead of them. Most important in this case, they were offered land back in Mexico, 
They were offered the opportunity to have a self-sustaining economic life back in Mexico, and they took that opportunity. They went for it. So for me, when I look back at the 1930s, it's really important to remember that this is a moment of, <clears throat> excuse me, this is a moment of Mexican immigrants making decisions and choices. It is not a moment of Mexican immigrants getting pushed around by the U.S. Border Patrol or by deportation agents. This is true today as well. We can put up any wall we want to. We can hire as many Border Patrol officers as we want. We can have ICE raids across the country. We can promote and we can say we're going to deport everybody. That is not what's going to determine the future of human mobility at the U.S.-Mexico border. It is people, it is families who are looking at the options ahead of them, who will break all barriers, jump all walls, and do whatever they need to do to feed their families and to take care of themselves on either side of the border. We have got to stop thinking about deportation as something that determines the future of the U.S.-Mexico border or of migration. In fact, it is us as human beings who determine that future. I'd be happy to talk about Million Dollar Hoods. So Million Dollar Hoods is a digital mapping project where we show how much is spent per neighborhood on incarceration in Los Angeles. And it's really been like wildfire. We've been able to show that in some communities we're spending tens of millions of dollars every year locking up local residents and that largely we're locking up folks on drug possession charges and DUIs. So the argument that we're making with these maps is that if we take the money out of policing and incarceration and put it into the services that we know make communities healthier and stronger, education to be one, um, employment, counseling, that that's the way we're going to reach true public safety.